is at some point to say, we are married, we are tied at the hip. What are we going to do about this? You know, and, and how do we make sure we feel on the same page addressing this issue that's bothering both of us? On today's episode, we have a very insightful discussion with John Howard. John is a relationship therapist and educator with over 15 years of experience helping people have awesome relationships. He's dedicated to helping spread love in the world by helping people have stronger, healthier relationships. He helps singles find and develop great relationships and helps couples stay on track and enjoy their life together. John maintains a private practice, Austin Professional Counseling in Austin, Texas, where he helps couples heal their wounds, reset, and thrive, and helps singles date wisely. He also helps individuals with depression, anxiety, self-esteem issues, and leads meditation and spiritual development groups. In 2014, John created the Ready, Set, Love program, a 12-week online course that advances couples' skills in connection, intimacy, and communication. He's also the host of the Ready, Set, Love podcast on iTunes and the author of numerous articles. He is currently working on his own couples therapy model, Presence Therapy, designed to help partners be more fully present with one another. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, welcome friends to the Stronger Marriage Connection podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dave Schramm here at Utah State University, alongside an amazing co-host, Dr. Liz Hale, a clinical licensed psychologist. And we are dedicating our time and our resources to really bring you the best tips and tools to help you have the marriage of your dreams. Well, we're so excited to have John Howard on the show today. You ready for this? He is a relationship therapist. He's an educator. He's a podcaster and author of the book, More Than Words. And he's a huge fan of the term connection, just like we are here on the Stronger Marriage Connection podcast. Dave, it's a pleasure to be here with you and Liz. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, welcome to the show, John. Grateful to have you on here. Okay, now, John, you have some some unique training. Uh, I love it. As I was reading more about you and what you bring as a marriage and family therapist, you trained as a leading at a leading training institute, right, for neuroscience based couples therapy. So, tell us a little about about that and your personal background. Well, many of your listeners probably know that brain science has changed uh, the field of psychology and relationship health quite a bit. Um, the more we know about the brain, the more we can help people connect. And so there's been some methods that are used in couples therapy that have changed over the last 10, 15 years because of that. But what I love about incorporating neuroscience is the efficiency of understanding connection. So, you know, a lot of times we're trying to connect with our partners and it's not working. We're Mm -hmm. trying to communicate and it's not working. Well, if you understand a little bit more about the brain and the weird things it does and the automatic things it tends to do, it makes you a little bit smarter about how to hack mm-hmm. that system, uh, you know, learn to pick your spots, learn how to access your partner in the right ways. And so brain science really makes us more effective at connection. Mm-hmm. Excellent. I love, and that's ex- it's so exciting to me. And, you know, of course, the number one problem that couples say they have is communication. We came to therapy today because we can't communicate. And Typically, we're communicating just fine, right, John? We may not be com- communicating the wisest of words and feelings and thoughts, but we're communicating. And you say communication is out and connection is in. We are just begging for more information. Tell us more about connection. Well, so, you know, in, in Western society, we tend to communicate to connect. And that's because a lot of our education system is very logical. It's analytic. And so we try to connect based on ideas and concepts and, you know, things we might agree on. And of course, anyone who's married knows that that will easily get you in trouble because we don't see the world the same way. We don't have the same habits or even, you know, family culture uh, that we come in with and so on. And so what's very important is to understand that the opposite is more effective to connect first in order to communicate. And the reason why that works better is communication is often annoying to the nervous system. The nervous system, which is the part of the brain that actually measures connection, just wants to know that we're okay, that you like me, that we have each other's back, that I can trust you. It's a very simple calculation. But when we communicate with words and concepts, 
we stress the nervous system because there's all this fancy stuff and differences of opinion to keep track of. So that mild annoyance often shows up as a disconnect. I know everyone listening can relate to that because it happens multiple times a day. Well, if you understand that if you connect first and put the nervous system at ease, then people's minds open up, they become less defensive, they relax, they start to enjoy the interaction, communication starts to work much better. So this is one of the things we've learned from brain science is that connect first in order to communicate is the right sequence when you're trying to strengthen your relationship. Hmm. Man, I love, I love that idea. And I think it's really going to resonate because, and, and, and not to be gendered, but I think that there's a lot of women who says, you know, he won't talk to me and he won't communicate with me, but you're saying that it has to do a lot with that nervous system and being able to, some of that communication is, is making maybe us a little antsy and heart rates going a little bit. It's starting to make us a little bit nervous and, and annoyed. Tell us a little bit more about that nervous system, that connection before communication. Sure. Yeah. There, there's a couple issues there. I mean, men stereotypically, you know, are accused of not sharing their feelings enough, not opening up enough, you know, not being vulnerable, sometimes not even, you know, talking enough uh, to create a strong connection. Well, part of the issue there is that men sometimes worry that what they say might get them in trouble. Um, they don't know exactly what to say. They don't know exactly how to respond to their partner's feelings yeah. or complaints. And therefore, they become aloof and somewhat withdrawn because they just don't want to get into a situation that they don't feel very skillful in. So that's, that's typical in terms of men's experience in relationship. Well, if the couple knows how to connect first, what it does is it puts, you know, in this case, the man in this example at ease, that there is no getting in trouble here. That, you know, however we connect is a great way to connect. We're just here to support each other, to trust each other, to connect more deeply, to have each other's back. So there's a relaxation into the interaction rather than an avoidance of the interaction, which is what often happens. Now, to be fair, you know, men have earned that reputation honestly because, you know, too often we don't share our feelings enough. Um, and that's not just on the relationship culture, that's also on us. So simultaneous to improving the safety quotient through connection, I think men have some work to do, you know, to learn how to open up and share their feelings more, be more vulnerable and provide a more direct path of connection to their partners. I think that's equally important. And there are ways that we express connection. I think you, you talk about them in the book, eye contact and touch. Do you mind, do you mind going down a few of those, John? Yeah, I love these because they're very simple hacks and they're easy to remember. Um, you know, a lot of times when we think about improving our relationships, it just seems like such a big mountain to climb, so complicated, so many different moving parts. How are we going to pull it all together? Well, the language of the nervous system, which I describe in my book, is quite simple. And these are very effective hacks that increase connection. So I call this the language of the nervous system because... This is what the nervous system listens to, to decide how connected it feels. Like I said earlier, language can be very confusing to the nervous system because it goes through the frontal lobes of the brain. That's a different part of the brain. That's, you know, tasked with understanding concepts and language. And, you know, what you want to do is you want to learn to speak to the primitive part of the brain that measures connection. So how do you do that? Well, you can do it via physical proximity, you know, just sitting a little bit closer to your partner, for example. Uh, you can do it with physical touch. That's a very clear, simple way of saying, I'm here with you. I care about you. Uh, you can certainly do it with a little bit longer eye contact, if that feels appropriate. Uh, that lets people know that you're really there with them. Um, and also being aware of your tone of voice, because Sometimes we say things to our partner and we wonder why they're not very responsive to us. And often that's because our nonverbals don't match our words. Our, our tone of voice doesn't match our words. Our facial expression doesn't match our words. And so we have to be aware that our nonverbal communication is mostly what the nervous system is reading. And it uses that to interpret the words. Hmm. I, I wonder, John, let me follow up with that really quick because I, 
I wonder if that sometimes with text messages somewhere where we can't actually see each other, we kind of get into trouble or use caps or we, we almost put the tone into it. We're reading into it, aren't we? Yes, it's actually quite dangerous to try to settle anything sensitive via text message. Uh, you know, there's certain dangerous forms of, of interaction. Trying to have an argument in the car, for example, is, is another one. The car is, is mildly stressful to the nervous system. You know, you're, you're barreling down the road. You're not facing each other. You're looking, you know, out and, and, you know, you're sitting in this steel cage, uh, that's very electrically charged. So, you know, I tell people, look, don't have sensitive conversations in the car and don't have them via text because you lose the context of seeing someone's face to understand what they mean and listening to the tone of their voice. So if people have something sensitive to discuss, I recommend that they wait until they're together. I recommend that they wait until they've eaten and they're not exhausted, you know, and then sit close, hold hands, provide these markers of connection to the nervous system first, and then open up the conversation because now the nervous system understands the context. Okay, maybe you're unhappy with something, but I can see in your face and in your eyes that you want to connect with me, that this is about improvement, that you care about me, so now I can tolerate this. Whereas if you send me something critical via text, I don't have any of that information to go mm -hmm. along with it. Yeah, it to totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Let me pick your, your brain on another idea that you've talked about that I, that I really love. Um, you know, sometimes we get caught up in the, I, I need this, or I feel this. And that can, you know, in some programs, you know, we'll, we'll teach these types of things. But that can often lead to, I don't know, more of that disconnection that you talk about. You're a big fan of what you call we statements over, over I statements. Is that right? Tell us about those. Yes, that's right. Now, you know, it is an evolution of communication to use I statements. I think that's why they're often taught in marriage workshops and personal growth workshops, because compared to what a lot of people are doing, it is an improvement, actually, to take responsibility for our feelings and say, you know, instead of you are so bad at this, why are you doing this to me? You know, which is, you know, not going to work. Um, it is more evolved to say, I feel this in these types of situations. Um, that's more responsible. I'm, I'm bringing it home. Now, once we get to that, you know, and we're not engaging in toxic communication of blaming each other, there's an evolution step beyond that, which is to, to then talk about problems as a we. You have to remember that, you know, marriages and, and any type of couple is a team and it's a system. So at a certain point, it doesn't make sense to just be I and I and have these separate ideas and sets of feelings, you know, being uh, tossed around because the real question is, what is the team going to do? And how is the team going to own this problem together in a way that brings people together against a common issue? So the problem with I language is it's polarizing after a while because we get into these debates with our partners. I want this. Well, I want this. I feel this. Well, I feel this. And it's sort of an impossible, you know, tennis match of feelings that usually ends in frustration. Um, the antidote to that is at some point to say, we are married. We are tied at the hip. What are we going to do about this? You know, and, and how do we make sure we feel on the same page addressing this issue that's bothering both of us? So in the book, I talk about using we language rather than I language. Although if you're caught, you know, throwing blame at your partner, then, then you're better off yeah. with I language. <laughs> um, but once you make that step, you know, it's great to approach your partner and say, we are not very good at this. And I think we could be better. How can we support ourselves? That's a very connecting type of conversation. Yeah. Man. Brilliant. We'll be right back after this brief message. Welcome back to the Stronger Marriage Connection podcast. I love your idea also, John, of practicing. You know, once you're... Once your brain and nervous system is relaxed after a difficult conversation to come back and have a redo, actually. I've always loved this idea. My husband doesn't always play along with me. You know, he's a little resistant to the marriage therapist in me, but I love being able to say, let's, let's, can we talk about that? 
I really not want to understand what you meant and what would we do for another time so that we could really understand each other. But I just think that's brilliant. You highlight skill over compatibility. Is that right? Absolutely. And I, and I love that you pursue this with your husband. And we're all naturally resistant sometimes to, you know, our, our partner playing therapist um, or, or even our partner's ideas. But I think you're absolutely on the right track there because, yeah, because if we have a chance to, to do a do over with an interaction that didn't go well, we're also practicing how we want to interact in the first place. And nothing gets better without practice. You know, we, we know that from every area of our lives. So we can't just have a conversation and say, okay, great. Next time we'll do a better job. Well, no, we won't because we actually haven't practiced anything. That's simply an idea. And this is what I love about being a marital therapist is, you know, I get to help people practice, which is the only way that uh, habits change and skill improves. So the idea you're talking about, Liz, which is that skill matters more than compatibility is a very important concept for people to understand because I constantly hear people say, especially when they're dating, but even when they're married, I don't know if I'm compatible with this person. You know, I don't know if this is a good match. And, you know, I'll always ask why. And, you know, sometimes the reasons are actually pretty good reasons, but a lot of times it's petty things that are going to come up in any relationship with any human being. And, and therefore, the question is, are you committed to learning how to move through those challenges? Or are you going to keep rotating person after person into your life thinking that it's a compatibility issue? So here's what science tends to say about this. <clears throat> we don't generally bring people into our lives that we're not very compatible with because the, <clears throat> excuse me, the subconscious and the nervous system actually do a lot of filtering outside of our conscious awareness. So by the time someone makes their way in, we've done a lot of vetting, we've done a lot of filtering, we've made some decisions about whether this person feels safe, or not, whether we think we can trust them or not. So at that point, compatibility is mostly answered. What people are complaining about is that they don't have the skill to connect. They've gotten into the right relationship, but they don't know how to make it a great relationship from there. And so un unfortunately, after three or four years or seven or eight, you know, people start to feel like it's just not a relationship they can be in anymore. So it's important for people to develop the skills they need to be in a great relationship and not simply rely on whether it's a good match or on compatibility. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. John, do you have an example? Do you have an example? You know, I mean, can you think of a couple where they came to you struggling without, you know, divulging, you know, names or anything like that, but came to you really struggling and sure. how you help them through that process? <clears throat> It, absolutely. I mean, I can probably reference every couple that's been in my office on this particular topic because we're all in the same boat. You know, most of us did not grow up in families that displayed fantastic relationship skills. You know, some people do, most people don't. So we're sort of flying blind a little bit when we get into our most important relationships. We hope we have the skills and, and we hope that they go well, but the reality is that most of the time we don't. And what's interesting is even if we have a pretty good skill set generally for relationships, we don't have a good enough skill set for the person that we just brought into our life. Uh, everyone is unique. You have to learn that person's weaknesses and their fears and their habits and how to put them together when they're upset. And you know, all of that is unique to each person. So one example I can think of, Dave, is I, I had a couple in my office both attorneys, both very smart, um, very talkative. And, you know, the classic example of a couple that tries to connect via words and concepts. And it wasn't going well because like most married couples, they don't have the same idea of, you know, what to do or what things mean or what happened or who said what, you know, so there was this constant sort of debating of you know who they are as a couple and whose ideas are better and all this kind of stuff. So one thing I did with them, Dave, is I just asked them to stop talking. We actually got out of the chairs in my office and we got on the floor. And I had one person lay in the other person's lap 
So that person could just hold them, you know, sweetly and tenderly. And I asked them to not speak, but simply gaze into each other's eyes. And the person that was holding their partner was stroking their hair and their face. And so this is a very primitive, you know, simple exercise. But one of the things it does is it sort of regresses us back to childhood. It, it sort of reminds us what it, what it feels like to be held and taken care of by someone. So the real question I have in those types of moments is, do these people love each other? Do they care about each other at a foundational level? Because if they don't, it's going to show up in an interaction like that. It's just going to feel cold and sterile. What I discovered with this couple, Dave, is that they had tremendous, beautiful sentiment toward each other, very sweet and actually very tender, but it was never coming out in the you know debate of words and ideas that they spent most of their time in. So they had never had an interaction like that because it's weird, right? I mean, w- when would we ever do that at home? It's a little bit strange, but- under my direction, when they were willing to put themselves in that type of an interaction, they experienced how much tenderness and love they had for each other in that nonverbal holding. And then I had them switch so they could experience the other side as well. So that's an example of them realizing, oh, we didn't know we had this channel in our relationship. Now, if we feel disconnected, we can go back to it and we can use it. So the more they practice that skill of getting out of verbal communication and into nonverbal connection, they can prove their love to each other more and more. Now, you know, you you can't just do something like that once because the next time you do it, it's still going to be weird and awkward. Um, You know, what what are you going to do? Just, you know, suggest, hey, can we sit on the floor and you hold me and, you know, we'll just, you know, so people have to do it a few times to get comfortable. And then they'll probably use it more often. Mm, I love that, that principle, that concept. Now, I have to ask, many of our listeners, John, are parents. And it may not be the, you know, the whole lap thing, but it seems like that's the same principle applies of connection before communication. Sometimes parents just sit there and, and go and lecture and talk, talk, talk too much, and it drives kids nuts, right? So does that still apply? Absolutely. Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up, Dave, because I, I think that's completely true. And, and that's why the subtitle of my book is, you know, this is science that applies to all relationships, not just marital partnerships, because the nervous system is the nervous system. You know, the, the way it experiences connection is roughly the same across the, you know, these types of important relationships. So when we're dealing with our kids, If you understand how to put their nervous systems at ease, you will be a much more effective parent and they will trust you and feel safe with you. So they will open up to you. You know, as parents, we all have the experience of asking our kids questions and they give us nothing. And then later at some random time of their choosing, you know, they tell us everything that's happening. You know, it's it's sort of, you know, frustrating sometimes that we can't control control that. But that's because when we ask kids questions, they don't really know if they can trust us in that moment. They're not really sure, you know, why we're asking or what's up or do we have an agenda or they just might not feel emotionally safe to open up in that moment. But if you know how to connect to the nervous system and leave the words and concepts out of it first, you will notice your kids talking to you more. They will open up more. They will trust you more with with really small kids. It's brilliant to get on their level, you know, to, to get on the floor so that you're at eye level contact with them, because that also puts the nervous system at ease versus them looking up at this huge giant, you know, and trying to have a conversation and interaction with someone three times mm. their size. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. When I talk with parents, I often say connection and then offer direction and then give correction when needed. So connection, direction, correction in that order, right? Nice. I like that too. That's great. Beyond our individual pursuits, John, and maybe even individual therapy, close relationships are the greatest opportunity of personal growth. And relationships challenge us and they illuminate all the blind spots, whether I like that or not. But that, that's a good thing, right? Have seen those blind spots in the mirror. 
It is. It, it makes us a more whole person. Um, and I would assume anyone listening to this show is interested in having a healthier life, a happier, more satisfying marriage, and also growing as a person, which is really a requirement to have a healthier marriage. Um, the people who really run into trouble are people who say, I am who I am. I don't need to change. I don't need to grow. Take me or leave me, you know, but, but this is who I am. Um, that's a problem mm -hmm. because even if you have a good marriage in the first few years, people change as they age. People develop different interests. People mature. You know, things happen in life, D disease, you know, family crises. So you're not married to the same person year after year. And if you're not willing to adapt and learn and grow, your marriage is going to start to wilt. So one of the most important concepts in marriage is constantly learning. Do I have the humility and the curiosity to constantly be learning? That's a requirement to continue to have a satisfying marriage. And, you know, we all have blind spots. Okay. Neuroscience research has proven that there's no need to argue that there are things we don't know that we don't realize we don't know. Okay. And so when we're being arrogant and saying, I'm good at this, this must be your fault because I'm very talented in this, you know, this is all, uh, you know, our own idea of ourselves and it's not very accurate. So the best way to illuminate those blind spots is in a marriage or any kind of primary partnership because someone who lives with us and has to interact with us every day is definitely going to notice our weaknesses. And most people are resistant to that. You know, they, I don't, don't tell me about my weaknesses. I don't want to know. You know, well, the thing is, you know, if you don't know what they are, how are you going to improve? It's a blessing to have your partner say, I think we can get better in these ways and I will support you and I will encourage you. And to have a partner say, I want to get better in these ways. Let's do it. That creates a great marriage year after year. But if we try to pretend like we don't have these blind spots, we do get mm. into trouble. It sounds like, I mean, the in lots of research on this, the virtues of, of humility of um, Gottman and others have talked about that willingness to accept influence, to be to really be open and, and vulnerable. I mean, the, those seem almost like foundational the relationship. This humility really is, is kind of the is what you're getting at with some of those blind spots. Is that right? It, that's right. Yeah, and I think unfortunately the message a lot of people get, especially men in our culture, is that it's not manly, it's not strong. It's not part of being a mature, independent person to take that influence from our partner when actually the opposite is true. Uh, the strongest people are not concerned uh, with others pointing out potential weaknesses. They have the strength to digest that feedback and look at themselves honestly and say, I think you're right. I could get better at that. Um, or I'm not sure you're reading that right. Let's talk about it. But, but still remain open. And also, you know, this is also a spiritual exercise that makes people stronger. If you can receive influence from your kids and from your partner, and you can have the humility to say, I know I can be better, and I'm going to use your feedback to improve anything that I have control over. So what happens is you develop as a person, you become a more whole minded person. You're able to see different perspectives with, uh, you know, more maturity and wisdom and not just dismiss them out of hand. You become a better listener. In all ways, you become a wiser, more patient, more loving person. So, so who doesn't want that? Right. And, and, you know, marriage, especially in the first five years or so is such a great training ground for being a parent. Because if you don't know how to receive feedback, and be humbled, you know, by people pointing out your weaknesses, it's going to be very, very hard to parent teenagers, especially, and continue to have a good relationship. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it really is. Now, John, I have to ask, we, we tend to assign personal intent to our partners, you know, their poor habits, their bad habits, their, their behaviors. But the truth is, we're far more automatic than intentional. Is that right? 
That is so true. Yeah. And it's, it's a key thing I talk about in my book because it's something that we've learned fairly recently from neuroscience, right? So a lot of relationship books that have been written, you know, a few decades ago didn't have the benefit of the brain science. Um, and this is a mistake that even therapists make from time to time, which is watching people engage in problematic behaviors and assigning intent, bad intent to those behaviors. Well, honestly, most of the time people are trying their best and they actually want to engage in a productive interaction. They just don't have the skill. That, that's usually the bottom line is for whatever reason, family culture, personal culture, bad habits over the years, they don't have the skill to pull it off. But it's not because they want to be a, a problem person. It's not because they want an unhealthy relationship. They just haven't had an opportunity to, to practice the, the right way forward. So most of the time when our partners engage in what we would consider bad behavior, it's not intentionally you know, mean on their part in the way we might experience it. Most of the time, the brain is doing things automatically and quickly before it thinks about them. And that's especially true when it comes to facial expressions and expression of emotion. All this stuff is very automatic. It's very fluid. It's very fast. So you can't really assign any bad intent to that. All of that stuff comes from the automatic system. The question in those moments is, can we connect and engage to be better? Because it takes a team approach to be better. If your partner engages in, quote, bad behavior, the worst thing to do is to stay on the other side of the room and say, hey, you over there, get your act together and be a better person and let me know when that has happened. Um, not only does that not work, it's, it's not how marriage works. It's not how married couples uh, interact. What you want to do instead is say, we're not having a very good interaction. I, I think we need some skills we don't actually currently possess. Can we support each other and encourage each other to learn those skills and practice them so we can have a great marriage? Okay, so that is now the team attacking the problem and, and solves the issue um, that a lot of people get into with that. Picking up each other's flags. Now, that's advice we've never heard before. I love this, but it literally means seeing the world through your partner's eyes, correct? Right. So, you know, this is another version of, of what Dave and I, you know, were just talking about, mm -hmm. which is we all see the world through our perspective and we defend it. And that doesn't lend itself to a merged reality. Marriage is merging your life with another person. And that's a very hard thing to do. Because we all have our own habits, our own culture, our own perspectives, our own, you know. So how do you merge with somebody else and make it seamless and frictionless? So the answer to that is it's certainly not frictionless, especially at first. You have to work out the merging process. You know, so all these different habits you have about managing money and cleanliness in the home and parenting and you know, who does what? And all these things have to be negotiated as you merge your lives uh, with each other. So what makes that easier is if you can see the world through your partner's eyes, then you won't be so defensive. You know, if your partner says, you know, I don't know that this is how we should be maintaining the kitchen and preparing meals. Maybe we should do it this other way, like my family did it. Okay, so people get into these debates of whose way is better and what are we going to do? And it becomes sort of an annoying point of friction. So what you want to do in those moments is try to place yourself in your partner's mind and say, okay, let me really see it from my partner's point of view. Why does that look like a better option to my partner than the way I'm suggesting we do it? Can I really validate how that's a great way to do it, not just resist it? And can my partner do that for me and say, oh, wow, you know, your way of doing it is also great. But these ways of doing things are a little different. So now that we have validated each other and we're not competing, let's try to merge our realities and talk about the common ground. This is a very lost art, by the way, in our society at whole. Um, j just to add on that, Liz, that, you know, the, the family life in our homes is a microcosm 
of the problems we have in society at large. So when people don't have the skill to see things from different points of view and validate those different points of view, then they become more polarized in the culture at large when it comes to trying to connect with people that are culturally different from them. And this is a big problem in, in our country today is how much polarization there is and our inability in some ways to work together on common issues. So mm -hmm. the best place to practice that yeah. is at home. Mm -hmm. And isn't it true that what we practice at home, then we can take out, right? Into our workforce, in, at, at school, in social relationships. Yes. It's our greatest hope, I think, for, for a community and, and society at large. We really commend you, John, for writing this book, More Than Words. Um, it's, it's got a modern feel to it, which I really value. As, as marriage and family therapists, we don't just see one type of couple. I don't just see heterosexual couples. I see LGBTQ couples. I see couples who don't practice monogamy. It's non-monogamy couples um, with polyamory. It's, it's really very inclusive. And that seemed to really matter to you, didn't it, writing this book that way? I think it's important because young people especially are not always conforming to traditional norms when it comes to relationships and marriage. And it's important to me as someone who teaches young people and also engages in, in clinical work with young people um, to have a book that's inclusive of the way they're approaching relationships. It's not just young people, of course, it's people of, of all ages. But I think, you know, in many cases, we see the, the evidence of it most clearly in people under 30, you know, who may not want to pursue a marriage in a traditional sense. They may have their own ideas of what works for them. And that's fine. The, the message I want to get across is that marriage you know, you, you mentioned how it's a microcosm for the larger community, and it is. You know, marriage is supposed to be sort of an institution that helps stabilize the, the neighborhood and the community and provides a grounded resource for other people. And so if we think of marriage as that type of an institution, what's very important is that people know how to connect in a way that's loving and peaceful, and that gives them a happy, satisfying existence that spills over onto their children and onto people in their community. It doesn't matter so much, at least if you look at the science on this, what type of relationship they choose to have, how they define their commitments, you know, what specific cultural values they may have. You know, the, because a lot of people that pursue non-traditional relationships receive a lot of judgment uh, from others, and it makes it hard for them to exist within the community and have healthy support. Um, this is often true for gay couples in certain communities, uh, and it can be true for people that are pursuing non-monogamy. So it's important for us to recognize that if people are kind and loving and supportive, uh, that these are the values we should be celebrating in relationships uh, rather than any specific religious or cultural approach to relationship. Yeah. Wow. Well, John, we sure appreciate your time and the the information, the resources that you've talked about. Tell us more time. Where can people go to get more information about you uh, and your book? Sure. So if listeners want to go to getmorethanwords.com, uh, they can purchase the book there. They can purchase it wherever they want, you know, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or even a local bookstore. But if they go through uh, getmorethanwords.com, my website first, they also get some goodies, which I think are pretty valuable. There's a chapter I wrote on attachment which I think is incredibly important. This is the science of how to measure connection between different types of people. And it didn't make it into the book because we had so much other good stuff. So when people register on my website, they get that chapter for free. I email it to you. It also gives you access to me. You can email me. You can tell me you're reading the book. You can give me your thoughts. You can ask me questions. Um, so that's one resource that people can go to. Oh, that's great. And that's getmorethanwords.com. And they get... Uh free chapter that's not included in your book on attachment. Yep. That's right. That's yeah. awesome. Hey, mm -hmm. before we let you go, we like to wrap things up here at Stronger Marriage Connection with what we call a takeaway of the day. Kind of a, a summary, you know, a little short little snippet of what you hope our listeners will remember. What What's your takeaway of the day, John? My takeaway of the day is I think one of the biggest problems we have in modern relationships is how our attention is continually distracted by social media, the news cycle, our phones, our text messages, our emails, our work, our kids, our chore. I mean, it's very hard to find time 
to just relax with your partner. And keep in mind that the nervous system has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years in how it measures connection. And technology has only been around for 50 or 60 years or so. So our, our nervous systems don't really know what to do with, these, with, with the modern lifestyle and this modern way of connecting. So the takeaway that I would suggest for everyone listening is put away your devices. Don't be accessible for a period of time. Sit with your partner or with your kids, any of your loved ones. Look them in the eye, hold their hand, and give yourself five or 10 minutes of undistracted connection time. Tell them how important they are to you. Tell them some nice things about them. Compliment them. If you're working on an issue in your marriage, then say, you know, how can we get better at this issue and how can we support each other as a team? But that part of connecting first is absolutely critical. That's when the nervous system knows that you care. If you just glance up from your phone in between two text messages, and you say something to your partner, well, they might hear what you're saying, but they don't have that deep-seated knowledge of how much you care. So you have to really carve out time for that and be intentional with your attention. Love it, love it. Uh, Liz, what would you say your takeaway of the day is today? I love the reminder, John and Dave, about we, assigning, we assign personal intent to our partner's words or behavior. And I really love, I try to make this practice of the, I don't know mind, like, I don't know. I don't know why he said what he said. I don't know why he did what he did and teach my clients to do the same. The, I don't know mind has gotten me out of more pickles than being so darn sure I know what the intent was. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful, Liz. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah. That it is. speaks to the humility we need to have, you know, when our partners say mm. things to us. Yeah. And John, that's mine, actually, is when you said, you know, being willing to see things from another person's eyes and from their perspective, then it can it brings understanding. It brings more awareness. It brings appreciation when we can humble ourselves and be open and accept our, our partner's influence, I think is, is huge. I think it's fundamental to to connection. Well, any any parting words? Well, I was just going to agree with you on that. And, and you know, you referenced Gottman and he, he showed how critical that is in his work as well. But, you know, the other point I want to make about that is when we're willing to accept influence, we become a more whole person ourselves. I mean, th there are individual benefits as well. This is, you know, what companies started to experience as they brought more diversity into the boardroom. They started to realize, oh, these different perspectives make us smarter. They help us make better decisions in terms of how we conduct business. The same is true for ourselves. When we don't see our blind spots and we believe our own personal message, we're sort of caught in a very narrow view of things. Our partner is going to stress us out and challenge us, and sometimes it's unpleasant. But when we agree to accept the influence, we get wiser and more mature. And I think that's a wonderful bonus as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. man. Well, yeah. John, so I, again, I got I to gotta ask another question. What then is the key to a stronger marriage connection in your mind? I think the key is being willing to learn. Um, and you referenced this earlier, Dave, you know, being humble, um, realizing at all times that we don't have all the answers. And we're really developing a skill set together, hopefully with encouragement and support. Um, none of us have the skills we need for any given marriage no matter how great we think we are. It's, it's a process of discovery in every unique relationship, how to get stronger, how to connect more deeply. So this is not a judgment. This is not saying people are bad or deficient because they have a hard time. No, it's, it's all of us. We, we all struggle actually to have great connection in our relationships because it's hard. Um, but what makes it work is the willingness to learn and the humility to continue improving your skill set. Well, John, this has been such a pleasure. Our discussion on so many topics. I love the uh, brilliant, the nervous system, the the connection before communication. So many wonderful takeaways. So we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us on Stronger Marriage Connection. And until next time, do those little things to keep you connected. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, do us a favor and take a few minutes to subscribe to our podcast and the Utah Marriage Commission YouTube channel where you can watch this and every episode of the show. When you hit the like button and leave a comment, your feedback helps us improve the show. 
And don't forget to share this episode with a friend. You can also follow and connect with us on Instagram at Stronger Marriage Life and on Facebook at Stronger Marriage. Be sure to share with us what topics you want us to explore or what you loved about today's episode. If you want even more resources to improve your relationship connection, visit our website at strongermarriage.org where you'll find free workshops, webinars, relationship surveys, and more. Each episode of Stronger Marriage Connection is hosted and sponsored by the Utah Marriage Commission at Utah State University. Finally, a big thanks to our producers, Rex Polanis, Kirsten Wilson, and the team at Utah State University, and you, our audience. You make this show possible.